Sun Tzu's Art of War is the world's most widely read work of strategic theory. Among our masters, it's the most frequently quoted and misquoted. As one of the great books on leadership, it's required reading in military academies, in staff colleges, and even in business schools. It spawned an entire cottage industry of pop strategy manuals, claiming the Sun Tzu's relevance to sports, to business, and in one case, even a romance. It's been quoted in a lot of films and on television shows as varied as The Simpsons and The Sopranos. So what is it about this short, spare book, written well over 2,000 years ago, that inspires so much interest? One expert called it the concentrated essence of wisdom on the conduct of war. Why? So before I answer that, I'm going to let you in on a couple of secrets. The first is that the name of this book is not The Art of War. Rather, Sun Tzu Bing Fa, its Chinese title, which I'm pronouncing in modern Mandarin, is more accurately translated as Sun, a surname, Tzu, the master, Bing, military, and Fa, method, Master Sun's military methods. This book is about much more than war. It's about the totality of the military as an institution and as an instrument of statecraft. The second secret is that the book was not written by Master Sun, a general named Sun Wu who lived at the end of the 6th century BC. That's why I refer to the book by its title, Sun Tzu or The Sun Tzu, rather than saying Master Sun says this or Master Sun says that. Instead, what is happening is that some anonymous 4th century author has appropriated Sun Wu's military credentials. That author calls General Sun Master because he wants to claim that the military is on par with governance, with morality, with ritual, the traditional topics of other Chinese masters, such as uh, Master Kung Fu, Kung Fu Zi, who you might know as Confucius. This claim of master status for the general, especially for General Sun, is important if we are to understand why this seemingly bland collection of platitudes is actually a revolutionary manifesto on generalship. So now that I let you in on a couple of secrets about the book, let's think about the Sun Tzu's appeal. One reason why it is so potent derives from the promises of winning without fighting, of achieving strategic surprise through deception and maneuver. These were obviously appealing to Western audiences in the aftermath of World War I and World War II, and perhaps are even more so today when our adversaries appear less and less vulnerable to the conventional, to the American way of war. The promise of big rewards at low risks also explains the Sun Tzu's appeal in the world of business. In addition, the pithiness of the Sun Tzu makes it a useful tool for would-be strategists, those guys who want to validate their theories with reference to the classics. This can lead some people to cherry-pick the text. You know, something like peppering their PowerPoint presentations with pithy platitudes plucked from these pages. At least I'm glad they're reading it. Finally, some of the current fascination with this ancient classic can be attributed to interest in and concerns about the rise of China. Some may seek in the pages of this book insight into the strategic inclinations of the People's Republic of China. There's nothing wrong with reading the Sun Tzu from any of these perspectives. But I think that before we try to apply this ancient book to our contemporary problems, we might want to arm ourselves with a bit more background. The Sun Tzu wasn't written for us. So before we try to gauge its contemporary utility, it's a good idea to understand who it was written for and what it was written against. So I've divided my comments today into three overlapping topics. The first, the first is an examination of the history of the book. Here I'm not just talking about the unique historical conditions that gave rise to this particular view on strategy and war, but also about the fact that this book is a reaction against those historical conditions. This is not to say that only those with an encyclopedic knowledge of ancient China can understand this book, but a little knowledge goes a long way. A little knowledge of the Sunza as an historical event, as a historical artifact, makes you a better educated consumer, a more objective consumer of its theoretical and practical content. After we've looked at the history, we'll discuss basic elements of the Sunza's theory on the use of the military. Then as our third topic, we'll talk about the superior general and how we might put that theory into practice. So let's begin with the book as an historical artifact, an historical event. What is the Sunza anyway? 
The standard version of the book comprises 13 essays attributed to Master Sun. Given that they purport to be the words of the Master, they appear to be statements of truth, free from the extensive supporting analysis and numerous historical examples that we're going to see in, say, Clausewitz or Machiavelli. In addition, the Sunza is written in a very terse style. As such, individual passages read, in, actually in both English and Chinese, as discrete pearls of wisdom that are easily divorced from the rest of the book. For example, and I quote, The supreme excellence is to achieve victory without resort to battle. That may sound great, but when taken out of context, it's about as useful as telling some rookie Wall Street investor to buy low and sell high. Many versions of the Sunza also intersperse commentaries with the original text. When a translation is formatted like that, we tend to lose sight of the original coherence of the book. In actuality, the Sunza is a coherent and really intellectually challenging strategic theory. The arguments build, build to a rhetorical crescendo. The language is very consistent, very purposeful. And the author mercilessly pushes a theoretical agenda. Master Sun says, The use of the military is the greatest affair of the state. It is the terrain of life and death, the path of survival and ruin. It must be studied. That's how the book starts. This statement is obvious to us from a 21st century perspective, but why did our author feel obliged to make such a statement and make it the opening salvo of this book? To answer that requires a brief digression into Chinese history. From about 1100 BC to 256 BC, China was ruled by a dynasty called the Zhou, Z-H-O-U, Zhou. Under the early Zhou, the kingdom consisted of several hundred feudal states, which declared their loyalty to the Zhou king as the universal sovereign. The moral basis of Zhou rule, something known as heaven's mandate, derived from that king's benevolence and from his role as the ultimate arbiter between heaven and earth. But from the 8th century onward, the Zhou's moral authority had to be buttressed by the growing military power of neighboring dukes, rulers who came to be called hegemons. They were the protectors of the Zhou order. The first hegemon was the duke of the northern state called Qi. The duke of Qi implemented a series of institutional reforms that transformed Qi from a loose confederation of clans into a bureaucratically managed autocracy. In the process, the duke dramatically increased Qi's military power, which he used to defend the northern frontier, but also to control the rambunctious and ambitious Chinese states to the south. This was the job of the hegemon. Along with these institutional innovations, war is changing. In the 7th century, war was seasonal and highly ritualized. Battles between chariot-mounted aristocrats might involve a few thousand men on both sides. But by the end of the 6th century, we have infantry armies of more than 100,000 men. That's when General Sun Wu appears. Sun Wu was born in Qi, and therefore was an expert on the institutional and organizational revolution that had made the Duke of Qi the first hegemon. But it was in the service of the southern state called Wu that he made his name. In the late 6th century, Wu was locked in a contest for dominance with its western neighbor, Chu. King Hulu of Wu had the services of an able minister, a man named Wu Zixu. Wu Zixu was an exile from the state of Chu. And Wu Zixu's two notable qualities were his eye for talent and his unremitting desire for revenge against Chu. The king of Chu had killed his father. So in 509 BC, Wu Zixu convinces the king, King Hulu, to entrust the armies of Wu to General Sun Wu from Chi. And Sun Wu achieves a dramatic victory over the state of Chu. That victory elevates the king of Wu to the status of the hegemon. But Wu's triumph is short-lived. Hulu's successor weakened the kingdom through a series of protracted wars. In the end, Wu was ultimately conquered by one of its southern neighbors. That state, in turn, was ultimately destroyed by a resurgent Chu. To anyone reading the Sunzo when it appeared at the late 4th century, 200 years later, this great tragic drama of Wu would have come immediately to mind. In the two centuries that followed the fall of Wu, war accelerated in scale, it accelerated in breadth, it accelerated in lethality. 
in the Warring States period, which runs from the 5th century to the 3rd century BC, we see ever larger and better organized states. By the 4th century, only seven very large states remained. This is when the Sunza was written, around 330 or 320 BC. So here's the context that we need to understand. The Sunza was composed in an era where multiple states were large and lethal enough to compete for control over all of China. We have every reason to believe that each of these states could raise an army comprising hundreds of thousands of men. Now, China's famous terracotta warriors, that 7,000-man army of the afterlife that guards the tomb of the king who succeeded in uni unifying all of China in the late 3rd century, well, that terracotta army is a graphic reminder of the centrality of war, the scale of the military. And it's a testament to the amazing bureaucratic sophistication of these Chinese warring states. Now, you would think that such dramatic changes in the scale and the scope of warfare, where you have armies of several hundred thousand men, men armed with standardized weapons, armies requiring huge logistical support, you would think that that would have demanded a complete reappraisal of the military ethos. Instead, old aristocratic values, values of hereditary privilege and personal valor, still prevail in ancient China. The Sunza, with its anti-heroic bent, is an argument against that fundamental contradiction. For the aristocrat, combat is the arena in which he can display his martial virtue, in which he can settle family vendettas, blood feuds. By contrast, the Sunza claims, and I quote, that to reject battle and yet force the submission of the enemy's troops, well, that is the supreme excellence. This injunction is an insult to the aristocratic warrior. Victory without combat prevents him from displaying his valor. It completely subverts the primary purpose of war. In contrast to the aristocratic amateur, the Sunza gives us the methodical professional. But the Sunza is not just a critique of aristocratic pretensions. It's also an assault on moral philosophy, like the Confucians, for example. The Confucians who are vying for the attention of the rulers of these warring states. An interview that Confucius had with the Duke of Wei sums up his attitude toward military affairs. Duke Ling of Wei asked Confucius about military formations. Confucius answered, I have indeed heard something about the use of sacrificial vessels, but I have never studied the matter of commanding troops. The next day, Confucius departed. Confucius was the first master, the first zi, and his goal was to restore harmony within China's social and political institutions by returning to the moral tenets of the founders of the Zhou dynasty. Like the author of the Sunza, the Confucians claimed that their education, not their aristocratic pedigree, qualified them to serve at the highest levels of government. But the similarity ends there. Confucius dismissed the militaristic obsessions of the Duke of Wei. A Sunzian would have been delighted by them. Given this historical dynamic, Sun Wu, the sixth century general, is an exceptional choice as the source of this 4th century book. This is a culture where legitimacy is quantifiable in terms of antiquity. The fact that Sun Wu lived at the same time as Confucius, well, that fact is priceless. It gives Sun Wu or Sun Zhe credibility and justifies the claim that General Sun is, in fact, a master. But in contrast to Confucian morality and ritual in those sacrificial vessels, the Sunza claims that it's the professional management and employment of mass infantry armies that is the greatest affair of the state. So now that we've placed the Sunza in historical context, let's move to a discussion of the book as a work of strategic theory. And for starters, let's ask how a Sunzian would have responded to the Duke of Wei's questions about military formations. The Sunza makes three major claims. The first is that the book contains, obviously, the wisdom of Sun Wu, who deserves the title of master, Zhe, Sun Zhe, a thinker on par with the greatest philosophers. The duke would have been taken aback by the impudence, by the arrogance of that assertion. The second claim is that the sole purpose for the existence and employment of the military is to increase the wealth and power of the state. 
The Duke would have agreed with that, albeit only in part. Remember, he's an aristocrat. The third claim is that the general, not the ruler, but the general must wield the military with the same skill and autonomy that a master swordsman handles his own weapon. The Duke would have bridled at the general's primacy over the ruler in matters of war. We can see these three claims in stark relief in the very first line of the book, right? The use of the military is the greatest affair of the state, the terrain of life and death, the path of survival and ruin. It must be studied. We also see these concepts peppered throughout the book. For example, on the purpose of the military, right? It's to increase the wealth and power of the state. If it does not profit the state, do not use the military. On the autonomy of the general, we have this line. The ruler who has able generals and who does not interfere in their affairs, well, that ruler will be victorious. And finally, on the primacy of the general, we have this great line. The commander who understands the military is the arbiter of the people's destiny, the master of security and peril for the realm and for the dynasty. So armed with just a bit of the historical background, we begin to realize that what sounded initially like bland platitudes, buy low, sell high, are actually part of a radical and relentless sales pitch. The pitch is particularly relentless in its demands for a coldly rational, anti-heroic, and almost superhuman approach to war. This is because the author was not satisfied with the way that states were conducting their wars, and he definitely didn't like the criteria for command. Instead, the Sunza presents a revolutionary ideal against which military commanders must be measured. It is an ideal, but the military is now the state's largest and most expensive instrument. Its very existence affects every aspect of the state and every aspect of society. As a result, the Sunza's new ideal is vastly superior to the aristocratic heroic ideal that sees battle as ritual, and it's vastly superior to the Confucians who disdain military affairs. But as much as the Sunza is an elaborate assault on amateurish and vain aristocrats and on naive Confucian moralists, it's also a spirited delineation and a defense of that area, that realm of authority and expertise that defines the professional general. From these three claims, the ones I just outlined, we can derive the three core theoretical prescriptions of the book. First, you want to be efficient. Second, you want to avoid protraction. And third, you need to value the commander's intellect and his skill above all other things. So let's look at these three theoretical prescriptions in turn. First, be efficient. In order for a state to survive and to win wars, it must make efficient use of its resources and always keep an eye on the ultimate benefit to the state. The rulers of these warring states to whom this book is pitched now, they're vying for ultimate mastery over ancient China. They want to seize heaven's mandate. That end could not be achieved if resources were wasted in ill-conceived campaigns or in wars dictated by passions or aristocratic pretensions. The downfall of the state of Wu proves that the use of the military is, in fact, the path to both survival and ruin. So what strategies put the state on the path to survival and ultimately to greater power? Chapter 3 of the Sunza lays out a continuum from the most to the least efficient strategies. They are attacking the enemy's strategy, attacking his alliances, attacking his armies, and last, attacking his cities. The Sunza tells us that the superior approach is to attack the enemy's strategy. You attack the strategy by convincing him that his ways and his means are insufficient to achieving his ends. We saw Pericles try to do this by denying the Spartans their hoplite battle. After attacking a strategy, you might try to sever his alliances. Attack the ties that bind states to each other, but also that hold them together internally. In the American Revolution, the British tried this, right? They tried repeatedly to drive a wedge between the colonies in order to suppress the revolution. Well, after attacking the alliances, you might attack the enemy's army. This was Sparta's preferred strategy, right? Seek a decisive result. But in the Sunza, the costly expenditure of blood and treasure that comes from battle, that comes third in the list of efficient strategies. In other words, combat, battle, implies a failure to find more efficient means 
toward your ends. Last in this list of four is to attack the enemy's walled cities. Attacking a walled city is only the last resort. Now, there may have been some moral qualms here, right? Siege brings the war to the civilian population. But more importantly, sieges are impractical. They are long, they're expensive. An encamped army invites disease. Moreover, by laying siege, what do you give up? You give up maneuver, you give up initiative. In addition, attacking a walled city is a sure sign that you've gotten yourself into a protracted war. Which brings us to the second of the Sun Tzu's core theoretical prescriptions. Avoid protraction. This is a very important theme in the book. In fact, all of chapter 2 is concerned with the costs and dangers of protracted operations. Protraction poses a mortal danger, a mortal danger to both sides in a war. Neither side benefits from protraction. But we need to ask ourselves if this is always the case. After all, George Washington, right, he consciously employed a Fabian strategy, a strategy designed to frustrate the British, to draw out the war, to buy time, to win allies, to build up enough strength for a final decisive blow at Yorktown. But remember the historical context. Two Chinese warring states, right, they're like heavyweight boxers. They've pummeled each other for 15 rounds. After that, would they have the strength to defend themselves against a third boxer that jumps into the ring? Remember what happened to the kingdom of Wu, exhausted by those wars? But also remember the aristocratic warrior. He likes battles. He likes sieges. They give him the chance to prove his valor, his mettle. In contrast, the Sunza rails against the notion that combat and battle are ends in themselves. They are just one means to an end. The third core prescription of the Sunza places an emphasis on the intellectual as opposed to heroic qualities of the commander. The intellectual qualities enable the general to master the totality of the military as both an institution and as an instrument. These Intellectual qualities of the commander are also critical to the successful performance of net assessment. Remember that we define net assessment as knowing the enemy, knowing yourself, and knowing your environment. In the first chapter, the Sunza gives us five categories for net assessment to determine the nature of an upcoming conflict. The first category is called the way, or the Tao. This is the spiritual strength of a state its ability to mobilize for war, to face sacrifice, to resist the enemy's attempts at subverting their resolve and their cohesion. The second category is heaven, and this is literally the climate, all of the phenomena that attain above us, the environment in which we are operating. The third factor is terrain. In this case, it's developing an intuitive grasp of geography so that an army might move across the land in the most natural and efficient way possible. The fourth is command. This is the talent of what we would call the professional general, that, uh, the new role that this book is actually creating, the pivotal figure right, who must manipulate all of these five elements. And the fifth is method. That's logistics, it's staffing, it's discipline, it's organization. These are the means, the processes by which the general keeps the army, into a, keeps the army a sharply honed weapon, a weapon that's infinitely responsive to his will. So you see now how the Sun Tzu is revolutionizing ancient Chinese attitudes towards war. Command should no longer be based on aristocratic pedigree. It's an intellectual enterprise based on the ability to test and process the five elements I just named and to craft strategy in accord with their subtle variations. Whereas the aristocrats, right, they're born to command. The Sun Tzu in general has earned his command based on his intellect and on his mastery of the new means of war. And these new standards are more than just axiomatic platitudes. They're not buy low, sell high. They are an ideal that a commander must pursue. This, this explains the structure of the book. Chapter 1 identifies those critical calculations, those five factors that must be weighed before the war. Chapter 2 lays out the costs and dangers of mobilizing a state for war, especially for a protracted war. Chapters 3 through 12 showcase the nearly supernatural talents of the commander in the way he organizes his troops, the way he maneuvers his army, the way he exploits the terrain and the weather, the way he gathers intelligence, the way he shapes his forces and manipulates the enemy. 
But it's chapter 13 that finally explains how all of this is possible, the deft use of spies, of espionage. So if that's the theory in a nutshell, what does this mean in practice? The first key in practice is information superiority, a popular buzz phrase. You want to have superior intelligence, superior knowledge of the environment. At the same time, you want to limit your opponent's ability to know the true nature of the situation. This can be at the highest levels of politics and strategy. Or valuable intelligence can be something as seemingly trivial as the dust clouds stirred up by an army on the move. The second key is operational initiative. The Sun Tzu tells us if he is able to determine the enemy's dispositions and conceal his own, well, then he can concentrate, he can mass his forces, and he forces the enemy to divide. You want to keep the enemy off balance. You want to employ conventional and unconventional forces, infantry and cavalry. You want to keep him off balance through deception, right? You want to feign maneuvers. You want to feed him false information. You want to use intelligence and deception to distract or anger, or might even, you might even want to win over the opposing general, right? You can use your superior discipline to exploit his character flaws. You can also take the war to the enemy, invade deeply into his territory, multiply the stresses on his institutions and on his society. The third key is knowing when and where to deliver the decisive blow. You want to create and exploit a situation where you can make the best use of your resources. You want to know how to position your troops in the terrain, right, to maximize their destructive effect on the enemy. Only when you do that can you as the commander deliver the decisive blow, a decisive blow delivered with lightning swiftness. He says the fact that the striking hawk shatters the body of its prey, well, that's a matter of timing. But think about it. The hawk is this ideal hunting machine. It's an analogy for the superior general, the, the clever combatant. The hawk is like the commander, the commander who has the edge in information superiority, in operational initiative, and finally, in timing. To exploit these attributes, the successful commander must study the field of engagement. He's got to weigh the strengths and weaknesses of his military forces and of the adversary. He's got to plumb the will and intentions of his enemy and he's got to gauge the mood of the men. But the general is more than a, simply a processor of intelligence. He's a source of information. Like an unmarried maiden, the book tell, tells us, uh, shuddered in her father's house, and stark contrast to the strutting and preening aristocratic warrior. Like that young maiden, the Sunzian commander is metaphorically shuddered. He's a mystery to friend and foe alike. The only inf information that the enemy can glean about him, right? is that which is fed to him. As you can see, the Sun Tzu provides the modern soldier, business person, and sports coach with a, with a wealth of advice that is at once intensely appealing, but often very difficult to follow in practice. And I would add that there may be many elements of the Sun Tzu that you don't want to approximate in practice. Here I think we need to stay attuned to the, what are ideal types, that is, what we should aspire to, versus what we can actually realistically hope to achieve in practice. So there's a couple things to be on guard for. As you read or reread the Sun Tzu, ask yourself if it's too one-sided. Does it give enough emphasis to the interactive nature of war? You might also ask yourself if the author's apparent faith in the clarity and utility of espionage and intelligence at all levels of war is actually realistic. You might also ask yourself if war, or business, or even sports can be as rational and as antiseptic as this book seems to promise. Can war, in particular, be drained of passion, of deep-seated hatreds, be they personal, national, ethnic, or religious? For me, whose job it is to prepare military officers for the unique challenges of senior leadership, the thing that concerns me most with the Sun Tzu is that some may be inspired by this book to attempt to liberate the military from political oversight. The author of the Sun Tzu draws a sharp line between the general and the ruler, and he is jealously protective of the autonomy of the general. The Sun Tzu, therefore, highlights many of the enduring tensions between the military and the politicians that they serve. Remember, the book tells us the ruler who has able generals and who does not interfere with their affairs, well, that ruler will be victorious. 
But attempting to approximate that ideal type in practice can prove catastrophic. Rather, it's essential not to confuse the judicious exercise of political authority over the military, which is critical to good strategy, with the amateurish interference of a warring state's aristocrat in the serious business of war. So, to wrap things up, the enduring popularity of the Sunza is testimony to the evocative power of a book that speaks compellingly to readers, even readers far removed in space, in time, and in culture, from the origins of this book. I hope that I've whetted your appetite for it and persuaded you that reading it against the historical situation it was designed to address actually makes the book more interesting. It makes it more vital and ultimately more useful when dealing with the problems of today. The Sunza does not have a monopoly on wisdom, but reading it carefully and understanding the author's larger purpose can be both a marvelous educational experience and may, well, improve your chances in any field. I'll see you next time.